I'm Kushu Parekh, fifth semester LLB, and it is an honor for me to introduce Neeti Ravendra to the audience. Neeti is a driven and passionate person, an undergrad medical student, and aims to be a good doctor and even a better human being. They are an intersectional feminist, a human right and queer activist who works on various social issues. Neeti has also co-founded the Firefly, uh, Firefly Community, a community-based NGO in Hyderabad that works for gender and inclusion with an aim to raise awareness and create a safe space through art. They have organized various workshops on mental health and LGBTQIA plus awareness programs. Neeti is also the leading, uh, she's leading the petition to make Indian Sign Language the 23rd official language of India. They've also worked as a coordinating manager and a member of the medical team at Project Ashri during the second wave of COVID-19. They aim to be a psychiatrist, provide an advocate for equitable health care to all. Neeti, thank you for joining us today. It's an honor to have you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction, uh, Kushpu. Uh, it's, it's an honor for her to be here. It's an honor to talk to all of you. Uh, I think more than uh, me talking, I think it's more uh, for us to discuss. Like uh, gender is not something that you talk and you listen to, but it's something that you take home. It's uh, a lot of, you know, discussions, you know, it's, it's a lot of conversations that uh, need to happen. And uh, only then can we understand gender properly. Only then can we implement change accordingly. Uh, that's what I think. And that's what I uh, really feel. And uh, Today, uh, I'm very, very uh, glad and I'm uh, very, very thankful to the Center for Gender Justice in Law of uh, CMR University School of Legal Studies, Bangalore, uh, for the opportunity that is given to me here. Um, and uh, first, coming off to my identities, who am I? Why am I talking about gender? I am a gay person and uh, I identify as gender non-binary. And I am obviously a final year medical student, like you all know. Uh, Kushpu has uh, told, told that about me. But uh, these are my identities. And I would like to emphasize on these identities. And I would like to uh, tell you about my identities because representation matters. And uh, wherever we go, I think uh, this is what is going to make change. And the reason why I'm here, uh, I have to, I have so many things to do. But like the reason why I'm here is because I need to be here and uh, the words gay, the words non-binary are something that you need to hear from me because I represent my community uh, and that's why I'm here. And also gender and uh, healthcare are something that I'm very, very passionate about. Uh, uh, being a doctor, it comes to me as a, on a professional front uh, that I change the face of healthcare. And uh, why, this, why does it propel me to talk to you about gender is, um, I think I, was, uh, I am a survivor of uh, child sexual abuse. I've been uh, violated in very different ways while I was a kid. Um, I was sexually and physically abused by uh, a few people in my life. And uh, that really impacted me. A lot of uh, you just uh, being an AFAP person, assigned female at birth person, you just told to shut up. Like you listen, you see a lot of stories around you. You li listen to a lot, a lot of people talk to you, but like you know, you just uh, think just shutting up, just not talking, uh, and just not speaking up is the way out. That is not, and because I thought that it was the way out. I had to lose a lot of things. I lost my childhood. Uh, a lot of innocence was taken away from me. Um, and I didn't feel it was right. I, it took a lot of time for me. It took, a, it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of work for me to be where I am today. Uh, to be able to, you know, for just for me to be able to live. It took me a lot of courage, a lot of guts, a lot of change that I had to make in my life. Uh, I, it took a lot of therapy, uh, a lot of work that I, for, for me to, you know, get out through the, get out of that suicidal thoughts, and uh, that's also a reason why I want to become a psychiatrist. Uh, a lot of things that had to go on, and that's when I realized this is not happening. 
uh, once I was out of it, I was like, uh, I, I, this is not how you're supposed to be wired. This is not uh, right. Uh, speaking, not speaking up is not going well. And uh, uh, once I decided that, I realized I should fight back. I realized I should gain my voice back. That's when I started Firefly Community. I think I was uh, 17 years old when I came up with this idea. And uh, I was like, uh, I, uh, I met a few like-minded people and we started the Firefly Community. It was uh, to uh, provide safe space to a lot of people who went through uh, sexual abuse, who went through issues of gender, like people being gay, people being queer, uh, people being gender non binary people being in the spectrum, a lot of people who couldn't find their voice, who couldn't, you know, uh, find a safe space, people who are disowned by their parents, who are disowned by their family, uh, a mixture of people. Uh, I've met a lot of people. And, uh, and then I realized, like, I, when I was growing up, I... So when I started Firefly Community, it was just a community, or just a safe space. But then I realized how important it is to assert your identity out there. And that's when we thought it should be an NGO. And we started uh, getting volunteers in and started working towards it. And uh, now we work around gender and inclusion and we're based in Hyderabad. Uh, we work tremendously and we uh, so we uh, I know that Bangalore also had a pride walk recently. We organized the pride walk in Hyderabad uh, also like one week prior to the Bangalore pride walk. And uh, I also advocate for Indian Sign Language because these are all the margins uh, that people do not usually focus on or emphasize on. And uh, I would like to break into that uh, stereotype and talk about it. And now, uh, let's start, uh, without further ado, I think I, I would like to start our presentation. So, uh, impact of gender discrimination on healthcare. That is going to be my topic for today. And before we uh, delve into what gender discrimination is, I would like to understand how, what is your uh, understanding of gender. Can anybody tell me uh, what gender means to you or uh, what do you think gender is? I see 94 participants. Uh, does anybody here would like to volunteer and uh, tell me what uh, you think of gender? What is it, What does it come to your head when you think of gender? Anything. There's no right or wrong answer. The main identity or the actual identity of the person? Uh, can you repeat? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, I said the identity of a person, maybe. Uh, identity of a person uh, uh, as to uh, what is what do you mean by identity of the person? Yeah, gender does mean identity of a person. We all have a lot of identities, but what is gender? If it's not, uh, that's not assigned it to a particular individual and say that it's, a, uh, it's an identity, but what does gender mean in general? Gender in... General means like irrespective of what he or she feels or like of what like what organs they have or like it's all about like what they individually feel about themselves according to me. Like how they are socially constructed. Uh, so socially constructed, we go to gender roles again. Uh, but we are we're talking about gender. We're not talking about gender roles and what uh, we've been assigned or what we've been given on, or what we've uh, learned all the way along in our life. But we're just talking about gender. Uh, is there anybody who would like to answer? 
it's it's fine it's completely fine like you know i am also fine live a medical student no judgments passed biological identification of female and male bodies carrying the opposite gametes which is capable of reproduction we are talking about sex here female and male and gametes are very very uh, like you you coming into a very uh, you know scientific and medical terms but uh, we're not talking about sex here so okay fine let me break it down to you i will break down what gender is to you so there is this thing called gender bred so like you see the the this is the person's body right uh and so let's divide it into divide it into the brain the head and the heart and what is between your legs right that makes sense to you your head that's your brain then this is your heart and this is uh, between your legs so the one the the uh, place where the rubik's cube is placed this is what is in between your legs and this is called the gen uh, sex this is called sex this is the biological sex that is given that is given to you while you're born that makes sense this is the biological sex that is given to you when you're born that's between your legs and when it comes to your heart this is who you like like the uh, the heart uh, signifies the sexuality who you like as an individual uh, be the opposite uh, sex opposite gender same sex same gender or uh, uh, non binary people or anything like it's it's the heart you might be uh, uh, you might be bisexual you might be asexual you might be uh, lesbian gay whoever but that signifies your heart and when it comes to brain this is what we call is gender your brain not your biological gametes not male not female uh, this is what we call is gender that's in your head so this uh, there's the saying which is gender is something who you go to bed as and sex sexuality something is uh, who you uh, uh, sexuality something which is who you go to bed with who you go to bed as and who you go to bed with sex is something we don't have any control of you just born with it but gender is that does that make sense to you gender is something what you feel in your body if uh, so there's uh, do you, are you aware of these terms gender dysphoria gender euphoria uh, can anybody answer that cuz i uh, i'm trying uh. to i'm not clear with those terms so okay so gender dysphoria is something when you're assigned so for example let's say uh, i'm a trans man uh, so first let's uh, break down what cis and trans is cis is if your sex 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 is between your legs uh, we i'm clear about that right the sex is between your legs and gender is in your head so if your sex if your thoughts and your sex is aligning then we call it is cisgendered a lot of people are cisgendered they they identify with the sex that they, that they are given at birth I, am i clear uh, are you understand yeah 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 i'm totally getting it yeah so uh, sex is and if you're uh, if you're if you're feeling it if you're feeling like uh, uh, your sex is for you the, the assigned sex you uh, is for you then uh, your sex gender and if it's not that way if you're not feeling comfortable in your body if you're not feeling uh, comfortable with your genitals or with anything that's happening in your body or the hormonal changes for a young kid then that's transgender you get it i just need some more answers i just need it to be more interactive yeah. thanks go to um then that Thank is you. then that's transgender and if so 
uh, and there is no black and white in gender and there's a there, because there's a spectrum of people that fall under gender there are non gender uh, gender non binary people gender non conforming people gender queer people a lot of uh, a lot of uh, identities fall under the spectrum so uh, we're not going to go into details of each one but i would like to uh, i would like to uh, make sure that you understand what gender sex and sexuality mean before we go into this topic right so that's about uh, what gender is and so now we spoke about gender we know what gender is and uh, a lot before we speak about discrimination i know you uh, lost students and you must know every, a lot of things about discrimination in general but before we know and discriminate according to the discrimination part where do you think uh, the discrimination starts from and our houses yep houses the actual place where the seeds of discrimination and seeds of gender are planted yep and and schools colleges and public places everywhere you go there's yeah yeah absolutely so i think gender is gender uh, assigning gender roles it basically starts at a at a very young age you don't even know you don't even realize you don't even understand that you are uh, uh, being given this gender role but you're automatically given it's it's uh, uh how how like uh, it is not under your control it's not under anybody's control but the society is stereotyped at that way and it's kind of wired that way that you're automatically given a gen uh, uh, giving people genders not even sexes you're just giving assigning genders to kids as they are born so for example let's say uh guys have to uh, have to wear blue girls have to wear pink guys get cars girls get dolls and uh, the the gender reveal parties how many of you are aware of these gender reveal parties i'm sure a lot of you know it's just uh, when uh, when you know the gender of the kid you you make a big you celebrate it as a party and you announce the gender of your child so that's called the gender reveal party so all these things they start from a very ground level from a very uh, grassroots and from a very basic level this is where the discriminate the seeds of discrimination are being planted and uh, in the, so and growing up i think this is something that is uh, very triggering for me as well uh, schools the schools that like the sex education in schools how many of you here have received really good sex education when you were in school at least at least did your teacher teach you how uh, bodies work and were you in the same class what was your experience with sex education in schools uh, i'm sure uh, when you were in 8th grade 9th grade 10th grade you might have that you might be having that reproductive health chapter how many of you actually had proper sex education while you were in school or did your teacher or did your professor teach you how it works or how how was it can anybody tell me like uh, we were taught about it but according to me though like we were taught about it but we were not in a age where we were supposed to understand it like we were not in an age where we could understand it or let's say maybe they didn't teach us the way that we supposed to understand yeah you could they just taught us for the perspective of examination for yeah, that particular chapter or something from exams. just so that we can write something for the exam and not because of a knowledge for that particular chapter like personally in my school it was like a two days lecture for the whole chapter i guess just for the examination perspective okay so you just uh, like somebody answered it's just going to be gametes uh anatomy physiology gametes uh then what 
fallopian tube and then how uh, fertilization happens is that all yeah like in ninth standard the subject reproduction uh, that we had in our biology subject was loose. just this only so mostly that so uh, this really triggers me because i have lost a lot of things because of this if there was something like good touch and bad touch as simple as that if somebody came to me and taught me what good touch and bad touch would be a lot of things in my life would have been changed and i have met a lot of kids a lot of young kids uh, a lot of queer kids who suffered with dysphoria and I've, i i know a lot of kids that tried uh, tried committing suicide when they were 11 years old 12 years old because they didn't know what to do they, they didn't know where to turn to uh, a lot of things would have been changed a lot of things would have gotten better in the lives of a lot of kids if proper sex education and proper gender education was done in schools how many of you agree how many of you uh, like think that pe- things could have been changed or how, how do you think things could have been changed i will go into the depth of it but i really want to know what your perspectives are uh so because of lack of sex education how many of you are aware of teenage pregnancies students kids catching uh, sexually transmitted diseases stds stis and and it's it's kind of uh, a lot of abuse that goes into it also because you you are under this gray side you're under this um uh you don't really understand where you are and you're at that tender age where you have to you you're forced to know certain things that you don't have to really know and this kind of triggers and opens uh, up uh, up uh, opens the children up to a lot of different medical and mental health conditions like a lot of attachment issues a lot of intimate partner violence that happens it's because of lack of sex education and forget the uh, preg- uh, the unwanted teenage pregnancies and uh, sexually transmitted diseases how many of you are aware of uh, i do not want to bore you with stats that's the reason i didn't get you stats and also unfortunately there is not enough research that is done in india about uh, in in terms of gender and sexuality in abuse so uh, there are not enough stats to uh, present you i know you would like want substantial evidence being lost students but how many of you are aware that there are a lot of teenage pregnancies that happen and i'm sure you might have been knowing a lot of cases within your friend circles also because you're in that college age and we get like in in my opd we get opd is the outpatient department in our hospital we get a lot of teenage pregnancy cases unwanted teenage pregnancies and a, a lot of cases come to us after uh, these people go to quacks so because there is no proper sex education they don't know who to go to also and a lot of people come from low socio economic status and uh, they do not have uh, enough facilities to uh, like not enough facilities they're just scared uh, to come out and uh, seek medical help they don't want their name to go out and they don't want their parents to know so they start to uh, uh, low quality medical uh, care or let's say let, they just go to quacks would not uh proficient enough to deal with such situations and we're seeing a lot of deaths a lot of infections and a lot uh, infant mortality rates maternal mortality rates a, a lot of mortality rates and morbidity morbidity rates are increasing because there is lack of sex education at the primary grassroots level which is at the school and this is something which is easily avoidable with the proper sex education but it's we're not remotely close uh to so, you know changing the uh, academic facet of education right now and that's uh, deeply saddening uh, but it is what it is but because of this a lot of i would like to repeat a lot of intimate partner violence a lot of sex abuse gender abuse a lot of dysphoria because children so for me i'm a, i identify as a gender non binary person and children there uh, uh when i was growing up my parents used to be like uh 
like the every every time we were in india and we go to a lot of weddings and events and everything so they used to expect me to like dress up a certain way like a girl or wear frocks and everything but i never used to feel comfortable doing that like i said uh, we just talked about uh, gender bread sex gender and sexuality right so i never used to feel uh, comfortable wearing those clothes because my sex and gender were kind of not equal to equal to the equation was not really kind with the with both the both the cases so i was not comfortable uh, wearing wearing uh, wearing clothes of a specific gender or something and 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 when kids go through that when kids like me go through that uh, when they're forced uh, gender roles upon themselves it's it opens up a very new area of introvertedness and it opens up a very new area of depression anxiety and a lot of new uh, mental health conditions as well and not having proper gender education is basically the main fault uh and the main lack where we are uh, facing a lot of discrimination and this is the reason why it's opening up doors for a lot of discrimination and hatred and uh, not to mention the bullying uh, that is always present in the school so and these people now become the pillars of healthcare obviously the next phase of healthcare would be the kids that go to school so pillars of healthcare doctors doctors nurses and support staff so these are the primary healthcare providers doctors nurses and support staff so okay for no now let's say i'll ask you a question uh when i talk when i say nurses what is the first thing that comes to your head just describe a nurse anybody just describe what comes to your head when i say nurses a person who helps a doctor no what is the first image that you see describe the image that you see mama girl basically like it's the first can you repeat sri lata mam basically a picture of a girl uh, as supposed to be a nurse like we see uh, the ward boys more less as compared to the image of a nurse as a girl right so the first image that usually people present with is a white scarf and a lady and why is that so i think the assigned gender roles that are we that we are taking up from the school level is kind of manifesting in our healthcare as well and in healthcare representation matters why why does representation matter anywhere and representation automatically reflects upon the healthcare do you agree with that representation automatically reflects upon the healthcare or anything uh, anything in, in in any way representation matters that's why we also have uh, uh, quota systems and reservations in place so rep representation anywhere is the key and why do you think that's the first thing that's the first image that comes to your mind when you say nurses nurses are ladies why here so when all the nurses are women there is no probably not that uh you know good healthcare can be provided for men because men would be somehow not be that uh you know um comfortable what are the so uh, let let's talk about the duties of a nurse i will tell tell you the duties of a nurse they are the i'd say they are the 95% uh uh pillars of healthcare if i if i have to uh Let's segregate them into percentages. Doctors, we come only for like one hour. Let's say we'll make a round. Ah, uh, we'll see all the patients. We'll leave. Nurses, they're always with the patients, twenty-four by seven. They are like the ninety-five percent support system for the entire healthcare system. And if these nurses are mostly women, and 
let's forget about transgender people non gender non binary people and everybody because that's we're not even close to uh, covering the gender disparity here i don't think we should talk about that yet but we'll talk about that when we go to doctors because that's more kind of reliable and how many men would be comfortable when uh, nurses change your bed pants like uh, we have to change your urinary bags we have to change your uh, pants when you defecate defecate is when you uh, pass stools so we have to change. everything is done by nurses how many how many of you like i i am sure as there are a lot men here how many would how few would would be really comfortable with women doing that think if there if, if there's no option i don't think we uh, have any say in that but like we need more nurses and it's uh, because the field has become more of a uh, only female uh, field there are there are so uh, there are very less men that are trying to opt for the field also they're trying to register and come into the field also and that's where uh, because of that because of the uh, education at the grassroots level the roles are assigned and now there are less male nurses less uh, representation in the field of nurses and support staff and now doctors the main uh, people let's talk about so i was trying to search for ratio of doctors based on gender uh, cis trans uh gender non binary but i don't want to use the stats of other countries because the laws legislations and regulations and conditions of other countries are very different from uh what is here in india uh transgender doctors so fortunately the field is changing now uh we are uh, in telangana this this first female uh, trans female doctor that have been appointed in the government service this month and i am sure uh, a lot of people here know about trinetra trinetra i think she's from manipal uh, karnataka people should know yes ma'am yeah so i huh i did not know her name but i knew that there was a doctor who has been appointed yeah trinetra is trinetra is another doctor she is from manipal um yeah so the the field is slowly changing especially in india uh but let's see and also uh, when it comes to choice of medical specialties this is something that i would like to add emphasis on again in choice of medical specialties so i don't know how many of you know but surgery is a very male dominated field and likewise OBG OBG is obstetrics and gynecology is a very female uh, dominated field and very um, uh, and not just uh, OBG guy hello uh, hello hello you know them no thanks uh, so when it comes to choice of uh, medical specialties also uh, like i said surgery is a very male dominated field and uh, still a, a lot of females face difficulties in uh, getting into the politics of the field it's kind of hard because i will tell you again again it, it it stems from that place where people think women are not capable enough and women do not have enough physical capacity or physical power and surgeries are a lot uh, usually a lot of surgeries are very long standing and it will take hours to finish a surgery but now because of the enhancement of technology and equipment that we have it's kind of getting better but uh, previously it was it was very uh, it was long hours and everything and all male male uh, a lot of male people used to prefer uh, taking surgery and since then uh, it it's always been that way it's still that way and uh, that's something that we have to change also and also uh, obg being a lot of females cis cis females especially and dermatology feels like obg dermatology are more again female oriented again that also comes from a place of assigning gender roles and uh, differentiating that 
based on gender like people uh, women are supposed to take care of their skin and everything so that is also something we need to change in 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 case we want to see a better healthcare system provided to everybody in case in case we want to see a uh, real good healthcare accessible to everybody this is something that we really need to work on that we really need to change uh the representation here matters because representation like i said is the key to change the facet and yeah uh and the more we hire people from the spectrum also the more we hire people from different um like say for example uh when i see a trans a female walk into my opd i will know what i should talk about because i am equipped enough i am aware enough i have been with the community i know what to talk i know that i am not supposed to hurt them i am i know that i'm not supposed to uh say something inappropriate or offend them i know what i should talk and so i feel like if uh, that happens only when there's enough representation people uh, so i come from the lgbtqia plus community so i know and when uh people from uh, so the ratio needs to match like ratio of doctors based on gender it's it needs to match for us to provide equitable healthcare to everybody and so there's this one time uh my friend called me uh so my friend video called me and then i picked up and then i was like why are you calling during duty hours so she had a patient who was deaf and mute uh, she, they were in the emergency opd and uh, the patient attender was deaf and mute the patient and the patient attender was were deaf and mute but the patient was unconscious and they didn't know how to communicate so she had to video call me and i had to interpret uh, whatever they were say, whatever they were saying in the sign language and interpret to my friend and that had to happen why is there so much communication gap why is there so much bias once there is no not enough communication once there is not enough awareness automatically healthcare just falls apart and once you, so the very very important thing in a in a in healthcare is just establishing that doctor patient relationship establishing that doctor patient connection and uh then something like this is breaking that when you're not aware and you don't know what to say to that patient your patient will expect you to be aware where your patient will expect you to be on point when you're not on point you're automatically giving them less than what they deserve and in healthcare there is no scope for good there's no scope for better you there's only best if there is no best so you either die or live there is nothing else you either die or live and only with the best possible healthcare can this can you make this person live and uh, not being aware of this and not having enough representation causes a lot of problems that will in fact ref uh, reflect upon the mortality rates again and uh, so yeah that's about the choice of medical uh, specialties now we we'll talk we'll talk about access to healthcare for till now we we spoke about the healthcare providers that is the doctors nurses and uh, um healthcare other supporting staff now we'll talk about access to healthcare uh so we have a lot of uh levels of healthcare that we provide so how many of you are aware of the levels of healthcare if you do you know at the village village level to urban level and then multi specialty hospitals is there anybody who know the levels of healthcare by any chance okay so there is anganwadi center there is rural health center there is public health center uh, in a city there is urban health center then after all this comes the uh, multi specialty hospital and along with this we have uh, pharmacies ambulatory services uh uh screening uh, screening centers like the diagnostic centers all of this come together 
uh, in providing healthcare. Like this, it's not just a doctor's job or a nurse's job because all of them should work together. All of them should function to together. And in when we talk about access to healthcare, there are two things. There are two scenarios that we have to uh, talk about. One is one there is no access to medical ser medical services. There is no equitable healthcare. The, the person can't uh, afford or because of based on the locality of the person they can't they're not able to afford one when there is no access to me medical health care at all based on uh, let's say uh, because they live in a very uh, rural setting or uh, because um, or because they uh, they're uh, they can't travel uh, that far enough. It, it could be anything, basically. One is when they have no access to medical services or they do not have access to healthcare. And the second scenario is not willing to uh, go, go and seek healthcare and go seek medical help. There is one. So there are two scenarios. If Tell me if you're understanding this. One, you have you do not have access to healthcare at all. And second, you have access to healthcare, but you do not want to go for it. Okay, does does that make sense? Yes. Now, when so now we are talking about the first case, the first in, uh, uh, case one, when you have access to healthcare, but you do not want to go, so you do not want to seek healthcare. These are all the things that come into play. Gender, class, caste, locality, and all the intersection, intersectionality, uh, intersectional identities that the person holds. Uh, why, why do you think uh, people do not access healthcare? Or why do you, uh, when they have the opportunity to access healthcare, why do you think people are not able to access healthcare? Like people are more busy thinking about what others think about them. Like they don't want to go seek help because they think like what others will think if I go seek help. Uh huh. And uh, so, okay. Uh. Hmm. Okay, what does it have to do with others thinking about you? Uh, can you give me a scenario? Uh, like in few uh, villages, there'll be this stereotype that uh, the lower caste people shouldn't access uh, the wells, the water and all. Mm -hmm. Like still uh, people do not share the same well to fetch water. Right. Yeah, in those scenarios, the people are like from the starting they are discriminated. With respect to that discrimination, people always feel that we are not being worth like giving that representation of uh, hospitality or like all that okay. healthcare thing. Okay, so they feel like they do not deserve it because they're told to. Uh, they're told so for generations. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That makes absolutely. And uh, so that is one thing. And also these people have access, let's assume these people are going to the hospital. So when I say uh, there is no access to medical health, one is locality. Maybe they're in the rural setup or because of caste or class, they're, they're feeling uh, guilty or they, they feel like they do not deserve to go to that place. And another thing is you go to the hospital, you go to the doctor, so, for example, let's say a woman walked into my OPD with the chief complaints of uh, pain abdomen. And me being the doctor, if I just dismiss it being, oh, it's just a period pain, period pain, how would that woman, woman feel? And am I giving them the uh, treatment that I'm supposed to be giving? Or, I'm talking to, or am I talking to them the way am I, I am supposed to talk to them as a doctor? When I just dismiss their uh, pain saying, oh, it's just a period pain. And imagine when the same patient, when if it's a male patient, if the same patient comes to me, uh, a male patient, I would not treat them that way. I would properly examine them. 
I would do all the steps of examination, which is so there are four steps of examination. I would do all the steps of examination and I would make sure that nothing happened. But if a woman walks into my OPD, I will just dismiss saying, oh, it's just a period pain. It's just a cramp. It will go away. So this is another thing that's that inherent discrimination that we have. There is discrimination that we do not see, that we also do not know, but it's subconsciously already there and ingrained in our heads. That is what is making healthcare even worse. Um, and uh, I would like to add on something if you yeah. don't mind. Mama, recently also I saw a case where the doctors in government hospital asked money from a man for uh, his wife's pregnancy thing. So people who do not have money and yeah. doctors who are being greedy. So with respect to that reason, also people might not wish to go because yeah. they don't have money. Absolutely. And uh, financial aid and having that uh, financial support is not something everybody has. And also, it, even uh, when we talk about that, also intersectionality is something that will come into play because socioeconomic status is big. Uh, so also, the reason why Britain's healthcare system is kind of better is because of, of the public healthcare that they have. The, Although the crime rate and everything is high, the public health care system is pretty good in the UK. Yeah, a, a lot of changes need to be uh, made. Maybe some, somehow, somewhere, someday we'll get there. But all these factors are really adding up to uh, not providing equitable and quality health care uh, delivery. And now these, these things are basically causing micro triggers. But uh, when you say, when, when, a, when a female patient comes to my OPD, like I said, I'm just dismissing it saying, uh, oh, this is just a cramp. I'm not even examining that patient. I'm just saying, oh, this is just a cramp. Because of my privilege, being whoever I am, or maybe I am not facing uh, uh, pain when I'm having a period. Or maybe I'm just, in living in some denial, thinking, "Oh, this is just a female. It should be, uh, uh, it should be period pain only, nothing else." Until unless it turns out to be a fibroid or something, and it, the patient comes back to you and uh, sues you for negligence. And unfortunately, there is uh, no one sues doctors yeah. in India. Mostly, that to near like the rural part, they'll be like, "It's my mistake." Yeah, and unfortunately, that's. The case that we've uh, that we're seeing so many times, and a lot of things that are just cut off, saying not a big deal, like say period leaves, and we don't treat period as a big thing. Though for some people, it's just bad pain. It's super bad. People who might be having fibroids, PCOS, a lot of things, a lot of different medical conditions and gynecological conditions. They're just not. Uh, giving that importance to them. And also anesthesia. How many of you know what anesthesia is? It's a thing given to people before surgery to make the particular place numb or something. Yeah. So, uh, so there was a scenario. When uh, this doctor, so we assist in surgeries and we, we're there when they're performing surgeries, we observe. And so this doctor, when he was the... Uh, uh, giving this patient, he gave the anesthesia to the patient. It was a female patient. So this uh, patient said, oh, uh, no, it's still paining. I feel something. I, I don't feel like the anesthesia is completely given I, because I feel little pain. The doctor says, the, the doctor was uh, dismissing and he says, see, I think women have uh, low pain tolerance. I think it's okay. They don't even increase the dose or anything. Just women have low, low pain tolerance. So we'll just go ahead. And then if the same thing, if a male patient uh, complains, it's not the same way that, the, the, that this doctor would have reacted. They would increase the dose. Because males apparently have uh, very high standards of uh, pain tolerance. So that's another thing. A lot of small things that were dismissed saying not a big deal will come together 
when we talk about delivering standard healthcare and dead meaning. How many of you are aware of dead meaning? So dead naming is when a transgender person comes to you. So they have a different name now, right? For example, uh, how many of you know of Elliot Page? Elliot Page? The Hollywood actor Elliot Page, how many of you know? Okay. So there are, so there are a lot of trans people. After, so are you aware that trans people have uh ha used to have a name before and now after they've transitioned or uh, they've realized that they're transgender of uh, uh, persons that their name changes uh, are you aware of that is anyone aware that trans people have to uh, like have a different name now like they have a different name and their previous name is not their name anymore and they do not identify with that. And when they come to a doctor, so the doctor, for them, it's very easy to just dead name them. And it kind of creates that sense of, it creates that distance between a doctor and a patient. Like I said, hampers the relationship between the doctor and the patient. Maybe it might not seem like a big deal to you and maybe you're thinking that it's cool that I'm uh, addressing, them, uh, addressing them with their previous name. But no, that patient will never come back to you because of the hostility that they feel. And now what are these micro triggers leading to? So the not so big deal, what are they leading to? So are you aware that the sex change uh, surgery was performed by a B-farm student and the patient died and a lot of illegal abortions happened so the quacks, I will tell you how they talk. So uh, one of my professors was telling me, so how many of you are aware of needle stick injuries? Anyone aware of needle stick injuries? So basically when you give an injection to the patient, if the needle is not sterile enough, uh, and when you poke the, uh, when you give injection to a patient, they might develop a small blood with pus, like how you get hurt and you get infected how the wound gets infected, it, it's just like that. If a, if a doctor does that, if a properly trained MBBS doctor does that, they would feel bad, they would feel guilty because I did it and I would completely accept it and I would not blame this person. I, I would probably, I'll probably treat them for free, uh, incision and drainage, uh, I'll drain the pus and I will make sure that they're fine, they're comfortable and uh, in, instead of uh, them saying something to me, I will only go to them and I'll be like, I'm sorry. But what will a quack do? So I've heard this from my professor. Apparently, there was a needle stick injury and it was a very big needle stick injury. This quack gave uh, a patient an injection and it was very uh, huge, like four into four centimeters or something. And uh, if it was filled with pus, and you know what this person says, the entire, all the disease in your body had come out through the injection site you know they have these convincing skills that you wouldn't imagine like saying something like that that is so wrong they have these convincing skills and when already this person is feeling hostility already this person is feeling like they do not belong that they are being discriminated and this person is talking so nicely to you they would obviously obviously go to the quag why would they come to you why would they come to a proper professional doctor who is not aware of your uh, emotional condition. And that's the reason, the micro triggers, you, you dismissing these things and uh, you not assuring, reassuring your patient and not being there for your patient are creating so much havoc. I'm not completely blaming it on the doctors, but I am blaming it on the society as a whole. It's supposed to be a responsibility of all of us that we do something about it. And a lot of people are going to parts and resorting to uh, ill healthcare. So that's also what micro triggers do. And why don't people access healthcare? So, like I said, again, stigma, inherent bias, low standard care uh, because of your identities, unaffordability, like Gautam, you mentioned. 
and all the basically all the products of inequity and discrimination. So now coming to what can be done as healthcare professionals, as lawyers, and as a society, I will tell you what should be done as healthcare professionals. So update medical literature. So in our medical books, we still do not have proper gender education. So let's say medicine, Davidson, Hutchinson, or anything, we do not have proper medical literature that can like even today when i was trying to prepare for the seminar i couldn't find uh good good literature that can support my uh thesis hypothesis so we need good uh, we need to update our medical literature and promote gender-based research awareness about issues of gender and marginalities provides key so basically so there was this case so during COVID, our hospitals were stacked with patients. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware, we all had that crisis where we were trying to get that one bed and one oxygen cylinder for somebody we know. So, uh, I, uh, with uh, Remedisphere and everything, we were trying our best to at least get one bed in a hospital. So that was the situation. And there were a few trans females and who were put in the uh, male ward. So... Um, and they were not feeling that comfortable and they wanted to leave. They wanted to leave because they were not feeling comfortable. And you can't really blame them because with, with that group of men and you growing up, uh, getting bullied all the day in your life and then suddenly you're with a bunch of men, it doesn't, feel, it doesn't really feel comfortable. And in situations like that, it's very easy. Uh, it, uh, I think we should provide screens. So how many of you are aware of screens, like that bifurcating screens, that green screens that we put? How many of you are aware? So we, so basically we need to put screens and cover them up in case we ca cannot accommodate them in a very, in a different ward because we're stacked. Then uh, frequent counseling and checking up, avoid dead naming, using wrong pronouns. Practice asking for pronouns while talking, taking their history, uh, improving the doctor patient bond while enhancing the quality and accessibility of healthcare. And as lawyers, it's not my, <laughs> I think it's more for you to say because I am not, I'm not a person who's uh, experienced or that good with law, and I am no one to talk about it uh, when I'm with a bunch of law students. And what do you think should be done as lawyers? Anybody? What do you think should be done as lawyers? Okay, so like how there are, uh, so when people say gay in a derogatory manner or make gay jokes or transphobic jokes, homophobic jokes, I think we need laws that uh, force inclusivity. inclusivity. Uh, and not just the laws that, uh, you know, that are just there in place, which is which are not helpful at all. We need anti-discriminatory discriminatory laws and protection laws. I uh, are you aware of the Trans Act, the Nalsar Judgment, and all of that? How many of you know the Nalsar Judgment and Trans Act 2020? So we need more anti-discriminatory laws, and uh, I thought I'll. We'll, we'll have a discussion about the transact, but yeah. Uh, uh, more anti-discriminatory and protective laws. And as a society, I, mean, I think we need to educate ourselves, be kind, uh, make it a habit to ask for pronouns, stop making homophobic, transphobic jokes, and try having conversations, more and more conversations. Stop hushing away from conversations. Have more conference conversations because conversations are something that will make change, that will implement change. Uh, coordinator for Center for Gender Justice and Law, CMA University. Would uh, appreciate the very fact that you are here on the webinar and you know you made it so great. And I would like to just focus on certain things, like as you said, hi, I, me, he, she are just the pronouns which differentiates the address and not the gender identity. So it was very great. And uh, also, I would like to you know uh, bring out the very fact that you have really molded the young minds 
to overcome all the obstacles regarding the gender identity it was really great to have you and we will uh, hope to see you in future as well for future uh, you know presentations and seminars as well thank you thank you very much it's an honor